All right. Um, so uh, uh, this uh, special webinar is sponsored by the AEG Great Basin Chapter, as well as the AEG Nevada Student Chapter. And uh, we'd like you all to think about, if you can, helping the student chapter out. Uh, you can uh, browse to uh, aegunr.org, and you can take a look at their web pages, their activities, uh, what they're sponsoring, such as this uh, webinar. Um, and you can, uh, you can get donation information from there. Uh, of course, if you want to mail a check right now to um, uh, make the check out to AEG Nevada Student Chapter, and then mail it to me, John Louie, UNR Seismology 0174, uh, 1664 North Virginia Street in Reno, 89557-0174. Uh, and of course, uh, if you just email me, L-O-U-I-E at UNR.edu, then I can give you uh, more information. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Spencer Whitman, our speaker tonight. Um, he's a PhD student in hydrogeology at the University of Nevada, Reno, uh, where he's studying under Dr. Ron Breitmeier. Um, he's gonna talk to you about uh, some of his doctoral work, uh, which integrates uh, 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 strangely enough, uh, the full range of geochemistry uh, through geology, through uh, hydrology, through geophysics. Um, Spencer got his uh, bachelor's in hydrogeology from the UT Austin in 2010, and he got his, uh, his master's degree with us in 2016. Uh, he's also uh, worked as a, uh, as a consultant um, and uh, uh, I think you'll see those uh, those qualities pretty quickly uh, when uh, uh, when you hear him uh, uh, speak. So I'm going to uh, stop sharing, and um, and Spencer, uh, uh, you can take it away. Great, thank you, John, um, and thank you thank you all for tuning in tonight. Uh, I know your time is valuable, and I appreciate you um, taking a few minutes to. Um, drop in and, and listen to what I have to say. So, let's see. Hopefully you can all see my PowerPoint there. John, John, are we good there? I just want to make sure before I go ahead. Looks great. Okay, good. Um, all right. Well, um, yeah, so today I'm going to talk to you guys about the uh, assessment of contaminant transport through the unsaturated zone at an acid mine drainage producing abandoned tailings facility in southeastern Nevada. And I've been uh, working on this project with uh, Dr. Ron Breitmeier and Dr. Clay Cooper. Um, the project is uh, sponsored uh, by the Greenfield Environmental Multi-State Trust through the uh, Nevada Division of Environmental Protection Abandoned Mine Lands Program. Um, talking to you tonight through the uh, Association of Environmental and Engineering Geologists. Uh, appreciate them having me on to speak tonight. And that said, let's jump right into it. Uh, so uh, first, I'm going to give you an overview of what we're going to talk about tonight. i um, going to go through the location and description of the site, um, tell you a little bit about the Castleton Mine and Mill site history, uh, the project sponsorship, um, I'm going to go through some of the research objectives and then a large part, uh, I would say most of the presentation, uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, research methods, like how I'm, how I'm attacking this problem. And, uh, and, um, and then I'm going to go through some results as well. Okay, um, hopefully you guys can hear me all right. I'll try to speak up a little better. Uh, so the, the Castleton tailings um, are located in southeastern Nevada. And um, you can see on the, on the figure on the upper right here uh, where it's at on the map. And it consists of uh, nine tailings ponds that are placed in a natural drainage of an alluvial fan. And they're unlined, unlike what you'd see in, in many modern day mining operations. So these were in place before uh, any, any mining reclamation laws were in place. Um, and the tailings resulted from the extraction of oxide and sulfide lead, zinc, and silver ores from 1869 to around 1978. 
Uh, the oxide tailings on the southern portion of the map there have a pH of about 8 and they're acid consuming. And the sulfide tailings have a pH of around 2 to 3 and they're acid producing. Uh, when the pH is that low, uh, it uh, mobilizes metals and um, enhances contaminant transport. So the rest of the presentation is going to focus mostly on those. Um, uh, we, we do know that um, from, uh, okay, someone's not seeing a map here. Uh, sorry about that. I'm not, I'm not sure why you can't. Okay, I got it. Uh, the depth to water um, at this site is greater than 110 meters. Um, and I'll get into more detail on that later. And there are several pits along the surface uh, that are a result of uh, reprocessing the tailings uh, in an attempt to derive further economic value from them. Uh, and you can see from this satellite imagery here that uh, what's happening now is that they're acting as a collection area for runoff during precipitation events. A little brief overview on the site history. Um, like I said, it was discovered in 1864. Uh, from 24 to 76, it was in operation. Uh, in 1976, Kermagee uh, uh, purchased several properties in Lincoln County, uh, including this site. Um, in 2005, they created the Tronox Company and they transferred hundreds of sites into a corporate shell without the funds needed for cleanup. Um, they eventually filed for bankruptcy, uh, which resulted in a lawsuit. And the Greenfield Multi-State Environmental Response Trust uh, was created as part of that settlement. Um, the trust is responsible for managing and administering funds uh, for the Castleton site, among many others. Um, and the Nevada Department of Environmental Protection is the beneficiary of the trust, and they direct uh, their remediation and investigation activities. So moving on to our research question, um, broadly, we're interested in what are the hydrologic and geochemical processes that are most important in controlling the contaminant transport? Um, more specifically, uh, to what extent and at what rate is the tailings le leachate percolating into the underlying alluvium? Uh, do those excavated pits that I showed, um, do they act as areas of enhanced infiltration and percolation? Uh, what is the distribution of groundwater underneath the tailings? What is the expected loading of contaminants to the alluvial groundwater that may be present beneath the tailings? And to what degree are solutes attenuated by geochemical and physical processes in the unsaturated alluvium? Um, and then which contaminants should we be most concerned about from a groundwater contamination perspective? Um, Another broad question is what combination of characterization methods can be used to cost effectively assess sites with limited funds and access. Um, then we're going to look specifically at do geophysical survey data corroborate model predictions or predict geologic boundaries and can we use satellite remote sensing to constrain hydrogeologic models. So what I'm showing now is a flow diagram that shows basically the whole progression of this PhD project. Um, and there's a lot going on here, um, but I'm just going to break it down into a couple broad uh, categories, which you can see labeled at the top. In the blue boxes near the middle of the diagram, there's several data items that are needed to, uh, to, uh, to run and make predictions from models, which are on the right side of the figure. On the left side of the figure, there are several um, activities and analyses that must be conducted to arrive at the data in the blue boxes. So as I go along through the rest of the presentation, uh, you will see at the bottom of each slide uh, parts from this flow diagram that will help you to remember the relation of that piece of the uh, presentation to the overall goal, which is to assess the the potential for uh, contamination of groundwater through the beta zone from percolation uh, in the tailings. So first we're going to talk a little bit about developing a geologic model. Uh, um, and the first thing we'll talk about is the drilling program. Uh, four borings were drilled into the tailings. Uh, 
two, two in the fourth pond from the top, and and two in the seventh pond from the top, and those are denoted by the black dots here. Um, and uh, in each pond, uh, one one uh, boring was was uh, built to find the tailings alluvium interface, and one more was built simply to collect uh, additional tailings for laboratory analysis. Uh, two monitoring wells were were drilled. Um, that's shown in, in the figure on the right with uh, the blue dot and the purple dot. Um, the uh, upgradient well uh, was drilled to uh, 483 feet below the ground surface, where it encountered uh, the a Lund tuff, which was uh, which was uh, dry, and uh, the down gradient well was to 378 feet. Uh, where uh, we encountered uh, saturated alluvium at 334 feet below the ground surface. Uh, the well was uh, completed there, but it subsequently lost water, and uh, it was likely completed into a perched water table. Um, so um, unsure if there is actually saturated zone there, um, and I'll, I'll show a little bit more on that later. Okay, uh, just one second. I'm going to try to uh, clear this. Uh... Okay, uh, the next the next step I'll talk about in the ge uh, geologic model is uh, some geophysical survey work that was done. Uh, and this data was gathered for Kellen McCullough's uh, MS thesis. Um, who was another person in, in our research group. Um, and uh, there were two, two general types of surveys were done. Um, two of them were seismic surveys, and those were done along the, these yellow lines that are shown here. And um, those work by introducing some sort of uh, seismic noise into the subsurface and then placing uh, geophones, which are very sensitive. Uh, uh, they, record very small variations in, uh, in ground movement. And, and so um, the, the first type of survey um, works from ambient noise. And uh, it, uh, the principle is uh, based on Rayleigh wave dispersion. And it, and it gives you a profile of the uh, S velocity below the ground surface. And um, the, uh, excuse me one second. Uh, and then, and then the third type of uh, survey we did was electrical resistivity, and um, that works with uh, basically you uh, place uh, electrodes into the ground surface and inject electrical current, and you can sense the uh, sense the uh, resistivity of the of the ground below your your area. And those are shown here in the in the red lines that are perpendicular to the yellow line, and so. What do we get? Uh, what do we get from from that type of analysis? Well, uh, in the top on on part A here, you can see the uh, resistivity, and you can see that there's a very clear area of low resistivity or high electrical conductivity, and that corresponds to the location of the tailings. Um, from the uh, from from the uh, seismic velocities, you can see part B and C, and we can also um, the uh, variations according to geologic materials there. Uh, you can see a very uh, low velocity zone uh, outlined in purple here, uh, which is most likely representative of the tailings. Uh, you see a, uh, an intermediate velocity zone, which is probably representative of alluvium. And then we see a high velocity zone, which is either representative of a welded tuff or perhaps a, a limestone that's from uncertainty. But anyway, these, these surveys give us a way to uh, understand the, the uh, subsurface geology and hydrogeology. So, so. And uh, so, so there's kind of two ways of looking at this. Uh, one way is to, 
to choose the, the model that best fits your data. Uh, and another way to look at it is to take a suite of models, which all have a good fit to the data, and look at the average and result as well as the uncertainty in the results. Um, and so that's kind of what I'm showing here on this the second approach is um, that stochastic approach. Um, and so you can see um, the results here are much smoother. Um, and I've also plotted our, our well-boring data. And so in black for this, this line here, uh, that's where the tailings alluvium interface is. And, and it uh, aligns fairly well with the velocity contract uh, in the seismic model. So these are p-velocities. Um, and the other thing that's, that's nice about this approach is that we can uh, look at the uncertainty in the models. And so you can see the uncertainty in, in uh, terms of velocity here. And uh, sometimes near the edges of the models, um, we're less certain about our results. Um, and you can also see some areas uh, that are not on, on the edge here where um, you know, models, different good fitting models have arrived at, at uh, different conclusions. But, but the good thing is that, that we do see a very low um, standard deviation in the outline of the tailings area. So, so the models are all doing well. Uh, another piece of information we can take advantage of is published geologic maps and cross sections. And so we can look at the uh, outcrop, strike, uh, dip, and location of known faults in geologic units. Um, and all this information can be digitized and incorporated into a geologic model. Uh, and so uh, that's what I'm showing here is um, using a geologic modeling software called GeoModeler. And uh, you can see on the top right that uh, you know, this, this model is composed of many cross sections. Um, and there's some regional scale cross sections in there, which we're looking at. And then on the lower right uh, corner, uh, we're showing a close-up of the tailings uh, cross-section. So you can see how the, the boring data is lining up fairly well with the geophysics data. Um, and then just another example of a regional cross-section to the left here um, with the site demarcated uh, over here. Um, All right, so moving on from the geologic model into the hydrogeologic uh, model and analysis. I'm going to talk a little bit about some uh, field sampling uh, and analysis that, that I've done. Um, the measurements that have been taken here are shown on the map, and uh, a number of them were for field saturated hydraulic conductivity. And um, the instruments used for those were a dual head infiltrometer, a gelf permeometer, and a mini disc infiltrometer, which I'll show here in a minute. Um, soil density was measured in several different places with a sand cone and drive core. Um, the utility of that will be explained in a little while. And uh, the soil and tailing suction and moisture content were measured with tensiometers as well as uh, measuring moisture content by dry bulk density in the oven. Um, so field saturated conductivity can be measured in a number of different ways, but we're just, we're basically measuring the uh, ability of the uh, soil to transmit water in its, in its uh, field state. So um, at the top right here, we're sh showing a dual head infiltrometer and, and that uh, just allows water to be ponded at different heights and infiltrated and, and the, uh, the flux rate is measured over time. Uh, the Gelf permeometer does a, a similar task um, by drilling a small borehole into the ground and then uh, keeping water at a constant, uh, constant level. Um, and the, uh, the, the mini disc infiltrometer does a similar, uh, similar task, although it, it infiltrates water under a slight suction. Um, and those values can be compared to laboratory repack specimens. Um, and they can be used in developing unsaturated hydro, hydraulic property descriptions, uh, which is what I'm going to talk about now. Uh, so uh, in unsaturated zone hydrology, we, we usually call this a soil water characteristic curve. And, and what it does is it describes the water retention and hydraulic conductivity at varying levels of water saturation. 
The important thing to remember is that water flow only occurs along continuous saturated pathways and that water is retained in smaller pores as water content uh, decreases and, and uh, suction increases due to the capillary forces acting upon the water by the grain. Um, um, and then as water content decreases, so does the cross-sectional area of the, the saturated pathways. So by measuring um, some properties uh, of the soil in the lab, we arrive at uh, these mathematical models uh, on the right side of the screen. And so the top one is describing uh, as, the, as the volumetric water content of the soil changes, uh, what, what sort of uh, suction that water would be under. Um, and then on the bottom right, uh, we're seeing how the relative uh, ability of the soil to transmit water changes as a, func as a function of the uh, water suction, or another way to look at that would be as a, as a function of the water content. Uh, those two can be uh, interchangeable. Um, I think that's all I'm going to say here. We're going to talk a little bit about how we develop um, those models that I showed on the last slide. Um, we can do it with uh, field specimens that are collected in situ as a uh, as an example of which would be this metal ring uh, driven into the tailings here on the top, or you can uh, collect a loose sample and repack it uh, to the density that you observed in the field, um, which is why we measured soil density um, earlier. Uh, so basically with all of these uh, tests, we're just coming up with uh, ways to manipulate the water content of the soil or, or the suction of the soil. And then we're, we're measuring the, the other variable and relating the two. Um, and so um, you can do that by connecting the soil to a column of water that's under tension. Uh, you can also do it by uh, manipulating the gas pressure in the pore spaces of the soil. Um, you can do it by evaporating uh, water out of the soil while you monitor uh, soil water tension. Uh, and for very dry samples, you can use uh, what's called a hygrometer, which uh, measures the condensation of, of soil vapor water by uh, shining a, a laser on a mirror. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to do this, even more than I've shown here, but here's some of the ones that we've used. Um, we've also done a lot of uh, measurement of hydraulic conductivity in the lab uh, using flexible and rigid wall permeameters. Uh, we've done quite a bit of grain size analysis on various materials um, using traditional uh, sieve and hydrometer analysis. And those uh, are another way to create unsaturated soil behavior uh, models uh, through um, what are called pitot transfer functions. I'm not going to get into that too much. Uh, but the, but the, um, the grain size analysis can also be useful for our geochemical models. Um, for example, um, specific surface area can be derived from our, from our grain size analysis. Okay, moving, moving on a, a little bit to uh, our hydrologic uh, analysis. Um, we know a little bit about the water table, um, but not as much as I'd like. So I'm gonna go over what we know, uh, what I know. Um, we, we can measure the uh, the groundwater table from uh, measured water levels. Um, sometimes the vegetation can give us some hints um, and we can plot what we know against the topography. And we also know that the groundwater is discharging at some perennial drainages. Um, so the two monitoring wells we drilled, uh, the first one uh, went into uh, the tuff and, and it was stopped there um, and we did not encounter groundwater. Um, the second one, uh, like I said, we hit a perched water table, and um, but we do have some some groundwater um, uh, information further further up gradient, um, and that water level was quite deep at around 300 meters, um, and we do know that the uh, groundwater is discharging at the Meadow Valley Wash uh, further down into the valley, um, and we have the topography, so. We can sort of uh, make some estimates about where we think the groundwater table might be, uh, but there's still a lot of uncertainty here. And so, you know, this is more of an illustration and a conceptual model than anything else. Um, 
So thinking a little bit more about some items that we need for a hydrogeologic model, um, we're going to think a little bit about boundary conditions. Um, and the main, the main two um, data items that we need there are, are precipitation records and potential evapotranspiration records. And so potential evapotranspiration is the amount of uh, water vapor that the atmosphere can, can take from the soil or from plants. Um, so in terms of precipitation, uh, we see that uh, precipitation is dominated by late winter as well as monsoon season. So um, early fall, late summer uh, storm and May to June is typically dry. And uh, in terms of uh, potential evapotranspiration, uh, it's a function of air temperature, wind speed, uh, vapor pressure deficit in the atmosphere and net radiation. And we see that it's highest in hot and dry months. And this data can be sourced um, from a, a variety of, of methods, but two, two ones that I've used here are um, using a, a nearby MET station. So the one I used is in Pioche, uh, which is a couple miles uh, from the site. And um, sometimes the MET station doesn't include everything you need. So um, in that case, I combined uh, some remotely sensed uh, net radiation data with the net data. Um, but there's also some uh, gridded data sets that are available. Um, and so one good example is the grid net uh, data set. And, um, that's a regression based um, based analysis and it's based on altitude, slope, aspect, and a couple other factors as well. Um, so one of the challenges with a site like this um, is that it's fairly remote. Um, the conditions at the site are fairly harsh. Um, it's acidic, um, saline uh, environment, uh, large temperature swings. Um, and uh, so that, that makes it challenging to uh, deploy um, field instrumentation with data logging uh, capabilities um, for a number of reasons. So, so to get around that, I've come up with um, a way to uh, gather some, some data to calibrate the hydrologic model using um, satellite imagery. Um, and what I've done is observed the, pond, the area of ponded water with Sentinel-2 uh, satellite imagery, which has a 10 meter resolution. Um, and you can see uh, on the upper left um, of the images here, uh, I am using Google Earth Engine, which is a cloud-based uh, platform for uh, manipulating uh, remote sensing data. And uh, you can see that my classification model has, has uh, delineated a couple different things. The, the green areas are tailings, uh, the blue are alluvium, and the red is uh, ponded water. And, um, so from that, I'm able to derive the time series of ponded water. Um, and I can combine that with the uh, uh, relationships I've uh, derived from uh, our fine scale topography data. So that was that was flown with a uh, unmanned aerial vehicle, a fixed wing uh, electric uh, aircraft. Uh, and um, it ended up providing us with a one meter uh, digital elevation model. And, and from that, I can construct a relationship between area and uh, water depth, uh, as well as water volume, um, which is shown in the middle here. Um, and then to start with, what I did was just constructed a simple rainfall runoff uh, model uh, of the uh, water that would be going into these pits. Uh, and that's shown on the upper right here. Uh, so it consists of a simple 1D uh, soil column uh, with a given hydraulic conductivity. Um, at the top of the soil column, you have uh, infiltration from rain. Uh, and when the uh, rainfall rate exceeds the infiltration capacity, you get runoff. Uh, and then you have some water draining at the bottom as well. Now the water that runs off would be multiplied by this contributing area around the pit and it would, it would be uh, funneled into the, the pit volume. Uh, from there, it can either infiltrate into the soil or evaporate. Uh, so by calibrating that simple model, which was constructed in Python, uh, by adjusting hydraulic conductivity, we get a, we get a fairly reasonable uh, fit to our, our ponding level data. You can see that with our predicted versus observed plot here. 
Uh, and you can also see it in a time series of model results from that exercise. Um, well, that's useful. Uh, it's uh, perhaps uh, not, not as good for our end goal, which is, is looking at the, the spatial distribution of, of percolation uh, all the way across the site, as well as uh, looking at uh, contaminant transport. Um, so later on, I'll show that I'm using a, a more sophisticated model um, called Mike Xi. Uh, to do that. And so I'll show that now. Uh, and um, uh, so this model uh, is good in that it, it actually uh, incorporates the physics of, of uh, water flow and in soils uh, in a more representative way. And it's spatially distributed, meaning that uh, the soil parameters uh, can be varied across each grid cell in the model. Um, and it encompasses all the way from the um, soil uh, atmosphere boundary all the way down to the saturated zone. Um, and so quickly, I'm going to show you some uh, example outputs um, from that type of modeling uh, that I've been working on. And I know some of some of you have commented that the uh, video is a bit slow, so if, if this doesn't work well, I'm sorry, but hopefully it does at least for some folks. So as we start the model, um, it's sort of warming up, and and as we uh, condition the model with with our forcing data on the atmospheric side, uh, we can see that we start to get recharged to the groundwater uh, table, and uh, that's sort of shown by these red colors here. And you may notice that they line up uh, pretty well with uh, the location of the depressions on the tailings. So that's uh, somewhat of a confirmation that our, that our hypothesis about these pits driving infiltration uh, may be well-founded. Looking at the uh, a, a cross section, so, so before we were looking at sort of a map view, and now we're looking at a cross section through the tailings uh, that intersects with the, the largest pit on the second uh, pond there. And so what you'll see is um, the flashes of, of sort of green and blue uh, are when the uh, when you get a rainstorm. And then this, this col column of uh, unsaturated flow below the pond uh, occurs after the water is ponded and, and infiltrates through the soil. So this sort of repeats as you have cycles of precipitation and then drying conditions and, and so forth. All right. So these models uh, stop at a, a depth of around 100 meters, which is sort of our assumed water table for now because that's uh, sort of the best information we have. And, uh, and then once once you set up your model, you want to make sure that your parameters are uh, optimized to give you the best fit for your data. And so that's what I'm showing here is uh, optimizing uh, several of these different parameters uh, based on our satellite derived ponding data. Um, and uh, this, is, uh, this is a type of optimization where we look at the whole parameter space um, as opposed to starting in one spot and then finding, uh, finding the best fit in a very small area, which would be sort of a global or a local uh, optimization. Um, what we see is that parameters that are very influential uh, adjust and find their optimal values quickly, whereas uh, parameters that don't have as large of an influence uh, have a harder time uh, settling in to their optimal value. Um, Moving on from the hydrology, uh, I'm gonna talk a little more about the geochemistry. And, and the overall purpose here would be to uh, gain an understanding of the geochemical system behavior. So we can do that by doing some liquid chemistry analysis, uh, solid geochemistry analysis, as well as uh, laboratory experiments. And then finally, synthesizing all that data uh, with some geochemical modeling. Um, and so each one of these items here, I'm gonna go through in a bit more detail. Um, before I get to that, I'm going to talk a little bit about the fundamentals of acid mine drainage chemistry. 
So this is a very nice uh, figure I found from Warren et al. 2011. And uh, starting from when you um, have uh, sulfitic minerals, as an example, pyrite, FES2, exposed at the surface um, to oxygen and water. Uh, when you do that, you end up generating iron 2, sulfate, and acidity. Uh, that reaction continues until the pH goes down somewhere below 4, um, at which point uh, iron 3 becomes more soluble. Uh, at this point, you can continue oxidizing pyrite through that original reaction, which is shown here, or iron 3 can act as an oxidant for your pyrite, uh, which, uh, as it turns out, ends up generating a lot more acidity than the, the original uh, oxidation reaction. Another important part of this diagram in relation to our site is the precipitation of iron oxyhydroxide, so FeOH3. Um, in order for that to happen, you have to have a significant amount of hydroxide in solution, and so you have to raise the pH of the uh, fluid. Um, and we'll talk more about how that happens with acid. Uh, so for the liquid chemistry, uh, we're going to analyze samples collected from field locations. Uh, here's an example here on the top right, as well as laboratory experiments. Um, and uh, these, these samples are all going to be representative of tailings water, and they'll be used in the laboratory experiments. Um, they have a pH of somewhere near two and a half, um, and a TDS of 10,000 to 12,000 milligrams per liter, which uh, for reference is about a third of seawater. Um, looking at the individual ions a little bit more, here we're comparing um, our, our leachate, which was uh, sampled from the field, to uh, laboratory prepared leachate, which was created by um, mixing uh, deionized water with uh, oxidized sulfide tailings. And um, you can see that the TDS and pH, um, I don't show the pH here, but they're fairly similar, um, as well as the conductivity. Um, there are some differences, uh, mainly that there is more manganese and magnesium in the laboratory leachate and more iron in the field leachate. Um, there were some charge balance issues on the field sample and there's a reanalysis pending, so we'll see if that, that changes anything. Um, but what might be happening here is that that uh, laboratory leachate was created from you know, one sample of tailings in one location. And so I think the next step will be to uh, gather some more tailings from a more distributed area and see if it matches uh, more closely the, the field value. Um, so next I'm going to talk about some beaker experiments I did. And these were just a way to um, conduct some preliminary experience uh, experiments that uh, would take less time than the column experiments. And uh, they're a good way to characterize the geochemical reactions between the leachate and alluvium and a good way to determine uh, contaminants of concern at the, uh, at the sort of um, stage where the tailings water has reacted with the alluvium. Um, so what I did was it equilibrated uh, first uh, deionized water with uh, oxidized sulfide tailings. You can see what that looked like in the uh, upper left photo here. Um, after I got stability on my geochemical parameters, um, that would be pH, ORP, dissolved oxygen, and uh, conductivity. Uh, the solids were filtered from the uh, tailings leachate, which resulted in this uh, sort of clear orange looking solution here. Um, and after that, uh, particles of less than 200 alluvium were um, uh, titrated into the, the soil uh, as it was agitated. Uh, and that continued until geochemical stability was reached once again. Um, the tailings were sampled both before and after this uh, experiment. And I'll go over the results from that in a minute. Um, here I'm showing the, uh, the uh, stability data for those experiments. So we can see that initially the, uh, the, the eye water was uh, very low conductivity and rapidly uh, moved up to about 8,000 uh, microsiemens per centimeter. Um, we also see uh, changes in ORP and pH, uh, which occur fairly rapidly. And uh, 
there were some issues with the DO sensor here. So I'm not going to talk about that data too much. Um, upon reaction with the alluvium, we see um, specific conductance going down as we're precipitating uh, various minerals, which I'll get into. Uh, we see, uh, again, the DO data is a bit anomalous here. Um, and we see a change in ORP um, as uh, oxygen is being consumed as uh, ox uh, iron hydroxides are being precipitated. And we also see a, a rise in pH as we're dissolving calcite from the soil um, from the P200. So uh, taking the data that we got from this experiment, we can build some uh, numeric models. Uh, so I used a program called FreakC to do this. And I, I basically started with an oxidized tailing leachate and I uh, numerically uh, added calcite to the, to the water. And, and it, um, monitored the changes in chemistry. Um, so what we see is that the pH rises and our, um, our uh, hydroxyl ions uh, increase in activity. As that happens, uh, we can see on the upper right plot here, um, in, uh, in our blue X's, we have our iron concentration. And in our black circles, uh, we have our uh, iron oxyhydroxides. And as we uh, add calcium carbonate to the system, our pH increases, uh, we precipitate iron hydroxide and our amount of iron in solution drops. As we go on a little further, uh, the calcium carbonate added into the solution causes gypsum, so that's calcium sulfate to precipitate. And that continues uh, until, we, until we hit gypsum saturation. Um, and then beyond that point, um, we begin to add uh, calcium carbonate to the system, and it's no longer being dissolved. So you can see that there's more and more calcite in the system. Um, so that's sort of our endpoint for the system in terms of uh, how um, the soil would change the, uh, the laboratory leachate. You can also see on the, on the bottom left here, uh, sort of where we've moved in the mineral stability fields. When we started out, uh, we were in the jericite uh, um, stability field, and then we ended up in the iron hydroxide stability field. So that's sort of a confirmation uh, as well that you know, our hypothesis um, is, is correct about uh, what's going on. Um, in terms of identifying contaminants of concern, um, what I did here was look at the uh, concentrations of uh, any elements uh, against uh, regulatory standards. So I looked at EPA uh, MCLs, uh, and primary MCLs, as well as NDEP profile three. And um, so I've listed in the lab leachate uh, the, uh, the element, as well as its exceedance factor of, of whichever uh, standard. And then um, on the right side, after the experiment, uh, we have uh, the same analysis. So you can see that we've reduced our number of uh, GOCs uh, from 10 to four. Um, and, and for most of those, the, the exceedance factor has also dropped by quite a bit. Um, so um, there, may, there may yet be some, uh, some contaminants remaining in the water, um, uh, but uh, to a large extent, uh, you know, we're getting rid of quite a bit of material. Um, okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about some characterization methods we use for the uh, solid phase uh, geochemistry. Um, one of those is X-ray diffraction, and it's, it's utilized for the identification of crystalline materials. And it's based on the constructive interference of X-rays uh, that are diffracted through a crystal lattice. And uh, there's some illustrations up at the uh, top right of the screen that kind of show how that works on an atomic scale. Uh, but the uh, sort of the uh, the data product we get from this is uh, is uh, something like on the bottom right here, where we have an intensity versus uh, two theta, which is the the angle at which the X-rays are uh, shined upon the sample and then detected. Um, and for each crystalline material, there's a specific pattern of of of, uh, of uh, diffraction that you can expect, um, and also, the uh, intensity of those patterns uh, are somewhat related to the amount of each mineral that's present. Um, 
another tool that we can use is whole rock geochemistry. And so what, what that does is give us our major and trace elements from the sample uh, as percentages. And um, to do that, we uh, melt the samples into a glass and then dissolve them in acid. And then the liquid uh, is analyzed with standard techniques. So examples of that would be ice inductively coupled uh, plasma mass spectrometry. Um, and those data can be used in conjunction with the uh, XRD and uh, scanning electron microscope, which I'll go over briefly in a minute, uh, to quantify our solid chemistry. Um, so uh, as an example, uh, I've showed the uh, whole rock uh, geochemistry analysis of our, our clean alluvial soil. You can see there's a lot of calcium, magnesium, carbon, uh, silica, as well as a uh, high um, LOI stands for loss on ignition. And, and it's basically when volatiles uh, leave the sample when they're heated up to, uh, to a high temperature. And, and this is mostly representing uh, carbonate in the sample. So calcium, carbonate, magnesium, um, calcite, and dolomite. Um, silica, probably quartz. Um, and we'll go into a little more about that. Um, another way you can look at this data is to look at a, a depth profile of your, uh, your uh, percentages by element. So um, looking at uh, these plots here, the uh, tailings of alluvium interface is very close to this 40-foot uh, level. And we can see in increased concentrations of uh, sulfur and iron. We also see uh, increases in other metals throughout uh, that same zone. Um, so uh, we're, seeing, we're seeing trends that are suggestive of uh, attenuation by the, uh, the uh, alluvium there as well. So uh, you end up with these, these two sets of data. Um, you have your whole rock and your XRD. And uh, sometimes they tell you similar things and sometimes they don't. So I, I came up with this uh, procedure to try to uh, uh, synthesize the two data sets and, and see if you can sort of uh, allow them to agree a little better. Um, and basically what I do here is uh, refine the percentage of minerals identified in XRD by using uh, our whole, whole rock geochemistry. So uh, we know how much of each element we have um, from our whole rock. And by varying the, uh, the amount of moles of each mineral that we identified in XRD, we can arrive at uh, an elemental composition that's very similar to what we found in whole rock. Um, and so uh, on the right, you can see where I've adjusted the, uh, the mineral percentages. Um, so the uh, red stars would be our original XRD amounts. And then the best fitting model is shown here with the black crosses. Um, and you can see that uh, by adjusting those, uh, we get uh, fairly small uh, percent differences with respect to whole raw uh, geochemistry. Um, most of them are probably less than 2%. Um, um, and since this is since this is coded up in uh, Python, it's really easy to change your uh, list of minerals that you want to adjust and um, test different conceptual models. Uh, it's also nice in that uh, since we've included the results from several good fitting models here, uh, we can uh, quantify our uncertainty a little bit, um, and you can see sort of the range of of answers within our error cutoff. Um, for the different minerals, and then uh, for the for the different percent uh, differences by element, uh, and this has worked pretty well for the alluvium, which I show here. Um, it's been a little more challenging for the tailings, uh, but that's kind of ongoing right now, and I think it'll I think it'll prove to be useful there as well. Um, the scanning electron microscope uh, basically works by focusing an electron beam on the sample. Uh, as that beam excites the electrons, uh, jump to a higher orbital within the sample. And then uh, as the beam is turned off, the atoms return to their base state and they, um, uh, they give off secondary electrons and x-rays, which are characteristic of the composition of, of the atoms in that area. Um, and if we scan the sample with an electron beam, we can uh, get a map of elemental composition. Uh, so as an example, in the uh, upper right here, we see uh, sort of these tabular shapes with uh, high concentrations of calcium and sulfur. And uh, most likely that's going to be gypsum, which we've identified. Um, and uh, 
these uh, composition maps are useful to confirm our XRD results, uh, but they're also very useful for identifying amorphous materials. Uh, so those are materials that don't have a crystalline structure and may not be as well characterized by our XRD analysis. Uh, finally, um, I've done some column experiments. And uh, the basic idea for those is to characterize the physical and chemical processes occurring in the unsaturated alluvium below the county. Um, the first set of experiments will be a, uh, were a conservative tracer experiment, uh, and those consisted of a, a NACL tracer as well as a, a deuterated water tracer. Um, and the second set of experiments, which hasn't happened yet but will, uh, is percolating the acid mine drainage uh, through the column. Um, and we're looking to characterize chemical reactions, uh, sorption and desorption, as well as cation exchange there. And uh, so, so we're going to run those um, column experiments, and then we'll uh, analyze the chemistry of the outflow water. And then uh, when the samples are done, we'll collect the sediment and analyze uh, them for solids geochemistry as well. Some quick results from the conservative column tracer. Um, First, um, the column was conditioned with uh, deionized water. Um, and then the tracer, which was mixed with uh, the saline as well as the de deuterated water, was injected. Um, and then afterwards, switched back to deionized water. Um, interestingly enough, we saw an earlier arrival for the saline tracer, uh, shown in blue, blue here, than we did on the, uh, the deuterated water tracer. Um, we, I think that uh, there's, a, there's a good chance that we know why that's happening. Um, it has to do with a, a phenomena called anion exclusion, uh, where uh, anions have a large hydrated ionic radius and they don't fit well into a small pore. Um, but that hasn't been sort of conclusively shown yet. Um, there were some issues with this. Um, the saline tracer uh, caused the soil to swell and uh, change the um, soil properties. Um, so that made it difficult to derive uh, dispersivity from these experiments. Um, and so additional runs may be conducted with a, a different type of saline tracer. Uh, just as an example of, of what we would do with the, uh, the laboratory experiment data, um, we can uh, take our data and construct a numerical model uh, with which we would derive uh, hydraulic and uh, transport properties. Um, so here I'm showing the initial uh, wetting phase of the experiments. So we packed the soils uh, dry into the columns. Um, and for the first five days, we're percolating water into the dry soil. And you can see on the upper right here, um, the soil suction is going from uh, quite negative values uh, all the way up to zero, which would indicate a fully saturated soil. Uh, then water percolation was shut off. Um, and the soil sort of drains back down to what we call field capacity or what the, what the column can hold under uh, gravity conditions. Uh, and then uh, percolation was begun again. Uh, but uh, with, with these experiments, um, we had some issues with soil settling and the hydraulic properties changing. Um, and so, you know, it's, these tests are iterative and they're temperamental and they're, and they're difficult to run, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, there's more tests on the way, and um, uh, I think they'll ultimately prove to be quite useful. Uh, future work for this uh, this project, um, a little bit more refinement of the geological model, uh, maybe some more conservative column uh, experiments, uh, reactive columns. Um, the hydrologic model uh, uh, needs a little bit further calibration and, and analysis. Um, the geochemical model is getting close, um, needs a little bit more work. Um, and then finally, once all these experiments are completed, uh, the, the data will be uh, put into a coupled hydrologic model. And, and the current plan for that is to use um, the percolation rates from our distributed model, which is showing uh, how the percolation is changing over the, over the watershed of the site. Um, so we have high percolation in the pits and, and relatively less percolation outside of them. Uh, and those will be uh, fed into 1D column models, uh, which are coupled uh, hydrous and freak C models. So unsaturated uh, zones uh, 
fluid flow as well as a, a reactive chemistry model. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, a couple people and, and organizations. Uh, I'd like to thank all of my committee members for their support throughout the project. Um, Dr. Louie's been great with helping me, me with uh, the geophysics um, lately. And uh, I'd like to thank the Greenfield Environmental Trust, uh, NAP, Brown and Caldwell, uh, all the AEG members and leadership. And finally, I'd like to thank you all for uh, spending your time here with me this evening. And uh, hopefully, uh, we've got some questions and discussion. I look forward to it. Thanks. Well, thank you so much, Spencer. I'm uh, trying to uh, uh, clap virtually here down at the bottom of my screen. Um, and um, so uh, we have some time for questions. Um, what I would suggest is uh, that you type your question into the question box and I'll read it. Um, or if you would prefer to be unmuted to ask it uh, verbally, um, you can raise your hand and um, uh, let me uh, see. Uh, I know these controls are, uh, are tricky, so I'll keep scanning the, uh, um, the list of, um, of attendees to see if anybody raises their hand or uh, types a question. Uh, thanks very much, Spencer. That was, uh, that was very interesting and uh, uh, can't wait till you get those last uh, uh, column uh, experiments done and, and uh, get everything all together. Yeah, me neither. You're expecting to graduate in December or was it August? Uh, December is the current plan, yeah. So. Sounds good, sounds yeah. good. Ah, okay, here's a, uh, a question from Angela Perisco. Um, she says, uh, I may have missed it, but are the tailings covered? Uh, no, they're not. Um, so that's, uh, that's another uh, portion of the um, uh, project that's, that's being worked on by folks other than me. Um, they've done some, uh, so, so they are uncovered. Um, and so that raises sort of the concern that they may be some air transport uh, uh, issues there, but they've done soil sampling in the surrounding areas and uh, haven't haven't found any elevated uh, levels of of metals. Um, so they are uncovered, but um, current current indications are that may not be an issue. Um, uh, okay, and and uh, actually, uh, Jonathan Price has a follow on question. Really, uh, he says uh, first, of course, uh, nice job. Um, what is the likely mitigation of this site? Yeah, um, so you know, I'm hesitant to say too much before all the data is in, but I, but I think one thing I can say for sure is that um, you know these these pits that are collecting water may uh, they look to be enhancing the percolation of uh, leachate. So um, uh, you know. Uh, Covering those up with uh, filling them in with soil and, and sort of regrading the site might be something that uh, that that would be helpful and cost effective. Um, uh, other than that, you know, uh, I won't be the one making decisions uh, for for how to mitigate the site, but I, I'll probably make recommend recommendations around uh, the pits. Um, Makes sense. Yeah. Um, from uh, Nicholas Whitman, we have uh, this question. For a transport model, especially one that is trying to account for groundwater contamination, I would imagine having correct transport properties are important. What properties are you having the hardest time getting? Yeah, um, definitely those transport properties are, are important. And um, I'd, I'd say I'd kind of break them down into two categories. Uh, one would be our sort of physical uh, properties, uh, hydrodynamic dispersion. So that describes how 
the, uh, the solutes spread uh, as they travel through the porous media. Um, and another one would uh, be our sort of our chemically uh, mediated parameters. So, so um, characterize, excuse me, um, characterizing the, uh, the chemical reactions uh, that may be happening, um, looking at uh, sorption and desorption, um, things like that. Um, uh, in terms of the hardest ones to get, uh, I, the, there's a real challenge with, uh, with the physical uh, hydrodynamic dispersion in that um, you can measure them at the lab scale, but, but then um, they're scale dependent processes. So it's really hard to predict uh, how they're gonna behave at the field scale. Uh, and there's, there's several papers that sort of show the relationships that we might expect, but um, it's, hard, it's hard to know exactly what they'll be. And, um, the lab experiments are not a great way to get at that. Uh, so um, I think I think those would be uh, one that we're having a hard time with. Yeah. Makes sense to me. Um, I'm just going to wait another 30 seconds to see if someone else uh, raises their hand or uh, has a uh, uh, has another question. Uh, here we go. Uh, from uh, Allison Kramer. Uh, can you explain again what was happening in your soil reactions when you moved from gerocyte to the iron hydroxide, I believe it was? Yeah, so um, there's a couple different things that are happening here. Um, the, the number one thing I would say is that we're changing our pH. So, so on the bottom left, um, you can see that when we start the experiment, uh, we are in the, um, so the lab leachate is the solid square. Uh, we're in the, the stability. You'll have, to, uh, you'll have to share your screen again, Spencer. Oh, shoot. There we go. Great, I see it. All right, so, so um, yeah, the, the number one thing probably I would say is pH change. Um, uh, so we're moving from the solid square here to the solid circle. Um, and as we add soil, which has a, a lot of carbonate in it, we're increasing the pH. And we're going to a zone where we're going to precipitate uh, iron hydroxide. Um, the other thing that's happening is we're going to a slightly more reducing uh, uh, system. Um, so the, re the redox conditions have changed a little bit. But that's all due to the fact that we're adding calcium carbonate to the system. Uh, very nice. Um, we'll uh, give it another moment to see if someone else comes up with a question. Uh, there's certainly lots of uh, thanks and, uh, and appreciation for the great job presenting here. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you, thank you all for coming again. I really appreciate it. It's great to see so many uh, familiar uh, names, no, no faces, but um, great. appreciate you all coming out. All right. Well, let's uh, let's give him another uh, uh, virtual hand, um, and uh, then we'll uh, we'll call this uh, this webinar to a close. Thank you so much, Spencer, for uh, all your effort here. And um, uh, thank you all for attending. Uh, uh, I, I know it's uh, difficult to get all this technology working, and I'm glad that uh, it worked out. All right, good night all, and enjoy your, your, uh, your cocktails. Thank you. Bye, everybody.